Five. Gunshot. I was getting out of Lee's Jeep around ten at night when we heard the gunshot. Lee was the first guy I had dated seriously since I came to Tech. I had met him volunteering at the Boys and Girls Club. I remember when I first walked into the gym and saw him. A 6'3 white guy with a gaggle of black kids climbing on him. Even I was a little surprised that he asked me out, a black girl. A dark-skinned black girl with natural hair at that. But I have to remind myself that it's the 21st century. I guess I have some of my own internalized stuff to work out. Lee is tall, like I said, so my height was not an issue. He was not intimidated by a woman who is 6'1", and, well, I liked it. I could nuzzle in his arms and feel girly. And he never asked me if I play basketball. <laughs> I sort of liked that, too. Lee was two years older than most college students our year. He had spent two years between high school and college as a student painter before he came to school. He had been real successful, eventually starting his own business. By then, it pretty much ran itself. He was studying history and economics. He talked about growing his business or joining the Marines or even about staying in school to be a professor so he could write books and teach history. I knew that was an idea he was still getting his head around. He was the first in his family to go to college. He wasn't used to thinking of himself as a scholar, but he could be. He was that smart. I called home and gushed to my mom about Lee. I called her a lot that first semester, nearly every day. She didn't seem to mind that Lee was white, just that I was happy and that he treated me right. The shot had come from Lambeth, the grad student apartment complex next to mine. I stopped and froze when I heard it. Lee and I were both staring at one another, wondering, questioning ourselves if we had really heard what we just heard, and waiting, waiting for any sign or sound of another shot. Then somebody started screaming at the top of their lungs for help. You're an EMT, Lee said. I am. It's one of the ways I pay for school. Yeah. Should we help? I knew it would be a few minutes before an ambulance arrived, and those minutes could be critical. There were no more gunshots, so it didn't sound like an active shooter scenario. Let's go. Hold on, Melody. Let me get my gun out of the lockbox and back. I stared him down. Lee, you are so white sometimes. Really? he asked. His confusion was sincere. Take it from an EMT, and a black woman at that. More guns never makes it safer. Leave it. Okay, but let me go first. Sure. I'd let him have that. I started to run towards Lambeth. I knew he would catch up. It never occurred to me what I was actually doing. Lambeth had a large courtyard in the middle. There was a guy in the middle sitting on a flower box, crying. Did someone get shot? I asked. He nodded his head. He was contorting his face as he rubbed his cheeks. I wondered if he was on something or just in shock. Where are they? I'm an EMT. I can help them. He shot himself. I can't fucking believe he shot himself. He was drunk, at least. I could smell the beer on him. Lee touched my elbow and pointed to a door into a stairwell. A drunk girl in a tank top was hanging onto the railing while she tried to negotiate the steps. Just as we looked over, she started to weave, lost her balance, and tumbled face first with a flesh-on-cement slap. Her head hit the edge of the flower box, and her neck was at a sharp angle. We didn't need more injuries. Lee, call 911. Lee pulled out his phone while I ran up to the girl. She was panting and sobbing, but her neck was intact. She was like a three-year-old grabbing my clothes and moaning. Mel, what's the address here? Lee asked from his phone. It's either 15 or 19 Maxwell Road. He repeated that into the phone. I'm going upstairs, I said. They say not to go inside, he said, this as I was already headed up the stairs. He followed me. Mel, wait up. On the steps, people started staggering by me. They didn't say anything. Their faces looked like they were escaping from a burning building. I heard people cursing and crying. The floor was littered with crushed beer cans and empty beer bottles. I walked by a few apartments. The doors were open. Each room looked the same. Furniture covered with broken potato chips, discarded clothes on the floor, lamps without shades, 
beer bottles and kegs on their sides. It must have been quite a party. There was one couple on a couch still making out, both naked from the waist up. Our presence didn't seem to disturb them. Most of the people were going in and out of one apartment at the end of the hall. I heard Lee relaying what he saw to the dispatcher on his phone. A tall, brown-skinned guy was leaning against the doorframe. His name was Rupesh. I had seen him in my statistics class. His shirt was spattered with a spray of fresh blood. He was pulling his hair with a clenched fist and staring at the opposite doorframe. I had seen him before, but had never talked to him. I don't even know if he ever noticed me to recognize me. Hey, Rupesh, are you injured? I asked. He shook his head. Tears were running down his face. Has someone been shot here? He nodded his head. I was pretty sure he was on the verge of going into shock. He didn't seem to recognize me. I'm an EMT. I need to see him. You're an EMT, he said, snapping out of his daze. Yeah. Is there an ambulance? There's one coming. Where? He's in the bathroom. There was a crowd around the bathroom door. A lot of people were trying to call 911. The dispatcher was probably overwhelmed. One idiot was filming with his phone. Rupesh yelled out, Get out of the way! She's an EMT! The people were not willing to move. They were like concert goers defending their places in line. Lee muscled his way through with his elbow in the air, then pulled me behind him. The floor was covered in blood. Not even a movie would have had so much blood. Critics would have said it was gratuitous and unrealistic, but that was how much there was. There is a lot of blood in the human head. Most of the spectators were standing in the spreading pool and didn't realize it. The victim was a white guy. He looked older, probably a grad student. He was shaking and convulsing. His tongue was lapping behind his lips, flicking spit on his lips and face. The gunshot was to his head. His hair was wet and sticky. The gun was on the sink. It was a revolver. Lee picked it up and thumbed the cylinder release. He was playing Russian roulette, Rupesh said. All the chambers were loaded, Lee said, dropping the five bullets and one spent casing into his palm. Two guys in baseball caps were trying to hold the victim down. He was splashing and rolling in the blood. The two guys had no idea what they were doing. Lee, get them out of here. Lee grabbed them by the shirts and led them to the door. They all were slipping on the floor. I watched Lee's boot rise off the tiles, red trails sticking to the treads. There was not a bit of white left on the floor. He's losing so much blood, some sorority girl said. No shit, Sherlock, I thought. I grabbed a towel from the rack next to the shower and wrapped it around his head. Lee, is the ambulance here yet? He went to the window and moved the curtains which were splattered too. No. What's his name? Lewis, Rupesh said from behind me. Lewis, can you hear me? I looked in his eyes, but they were darting in random directions. He had a plaid shirt on and a white t-shirt underneath, which was, weirdly, still immaculate. Hold on, Lewis. I put his head in my lap. I held his hand with my left hand and checked his pulse with my right. On the other end of the bathroom, his feet were squirming like he was trying to take off his shoes. I stared at them longer than I should have. Then they stopped. His hand was still twitching. I squeezed it back, but his pulse was gone. Lee, he has no pulse. I set his head down and knelt beside him. My jeans soaked up the blood, and I could feel it, warm as bath water on my skin. So much for universal precautions. Lee, give me that other towel. He gave me another towel from the back of the bathroom door. His lips were white and tight against each other, his brow furrowed, but he was still calm as he handed it to me. I was grateful for that. I put the towel under my knees. There were soon two red spots on it where my knees pushed it into the floor. But it was better than before. I told Lee to keep pressure on the head wound while I started compressions on Lewis's chest. His body shook from the force of my hands, but the rest of him stayed limp. His pulse didn't come back. The stream of blood from his head had slowed. I heard the ambulance. I kept up artificial respiration until the paramedics pushed their way through the crowd at the door. Lewis had died in my arms. The police wanted to talk to Lee and me, 
so we waited in the back of a squad car while they tried to get control of the scene. Lee held on to the revolver until he could turn it over to a cop. It soon looked just like the news. Police tape around the courtyard, dozens of emergency vehicles with flashing lights, news vans with their antennas extended up to catch the satellite feed. The coroners brought Lewis out in a black bag on a gurney. I wiped the blood from my hand and held Lee's. I saw all the blood on me and started to kick the seat. I've got it all over me. We were at the station until four in the morning. We sat at a desk while an officer took statements from us. All the desks around us were empty. The ceiling lights were turned off. The only light in the whole room was from the officer's desk lamp. The cop drank coffee from a styrofoam cup. He refilled it three times while he asked us questions. Did you know the deceased? Where were you when you first heard the shot? Which direction did the shot seem to come from? I wish they would turn on more lights. Lee dropped me off at 6 a.m. It was Sunday morning. The horizon was pink. Some of the ROTC students were already outside warming up for PT. My roommate, Trisha, was still asleep when I let myself into our room. From the way her eyes were racing under her lids, I knew she was dreaming. I took my clothes off and threw them in the trash can. My shoes, too. I noticed there was pink bubble gum on the top of my shoe. I was wondering how it got there and leaned closer. It wasn't gum. It was a piece of Lewis's brain. I felt ready to cry, but I was too tired. I took a long shower, scrubbed my knees and fingernails, then crawled into bed. Trisha's clock radio clicked on 30 minutes later. We both lay there listening to the newsman. A local university student died last night from a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. Police have ruled it an accidental suicide. No one, aside from the victim, was injured. According to reports, the victim had been playing Russian roulette with his friend's revolver after they had been drinking. Services have not been announced yet. The Commerce Secretary is predicting a robust quarter for local businesses in the coming months. I was there. Lewis died in my arms. What? Trisha's voice was thick with sleep. Her hair was still wrapped in a silk scarf. The guy who shot himself. His name was Lewis. Melody, are you dreaming? No. I haven't slept all night. Look at my clothes. They're in the trash. She got out of bed, shuffled across the room, and walked to the trash can. Holy shit! Trisha was Baptist. She never cursed. Don't touch them. Melody, are you all right? What happened? She was standing next to the bed. Her nightgown was wrinkled. Her eyes were big, and her mouth hung open. I could see her retainer wire across her teeth. I told her everything. Neither of us went to church that morning. We talked, but I never called home. 